on World News Tonight. Brazil in denial. History repeats itself under a different flag as protesters storm Brazil's government institutions, including Congress. Frigid temperatures. India suffers cold snaps amid increasingly concerning levels of smog. Biden at the border. With America's migrant crisis bloating to an unprecedented level, President Biden is on the ground for closer inspection. And Carnival Noel Blanc. Diversity and ethnicity combines into a colorful flair in Colombia's celebrations. This is Adaderana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. A very good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight, the second week of 2023. Now leading tonight on our bulletin is the turmoil in Brazil as Brazilian security forces wrested back control of Congress, the presidential palace and the Supreme Court after a flood of ex-president Jair Bolsonaro's supporters stormed the seat of power, unleashing chaos on the capital. The invasions were condemned by leaders around the world, including including U.S. President Joe Biden, who called the events an assault on democracy and on the peaceful transfer of power. Supporters of Brazil's former President Bolsonaro breaking through security barriers. Thousands of the far-right protesters then stormed through the country's Congress, Presidential Palace and Supreme Court. They climbed on roofs, broke windows and even tried to set fire to the carpet, which activated the sprinkler system and caused floods in the Congress building. These dramatic images come just a week after the inauguration of left-wing Lula da Silva, who defeated his far-right rival in October's election. It's an early test for this new president, and he's responded furiously. There is no precedent for the acts of these people. And for this, these people must be punished. We will find out who finances these vandals who went to Brasilia. We will find out who these vandals are, and they will be brought down with the full force of the law for this irresponsible act, for this anti-democratic act, and for this act of fascist vandalism. The president has ordered the National Guard to move in to reinstate order in the capital. Bolsonaro left Brazil for the US two days before the end of his mandate. The former president repeatedly questioned, without evidence, the credibility of the country's electronic voting system. And many of his hardcore supporters believe him. They've been camping outside army bases across the country for weeks and have been calling for a military coup. Far-right protests have also been organized in other Brazilian cities, including in Sao Paulo and Belo Horizonte. On the second anniversary of the U.S. January 6 insurrection, Kevin McCarthy clinched his decade-long quest to be Speaker of the House. It came with concessions to most ex extreme members of his caucus, the help of the former president he denounced on the House floor two years ago, and the prospect of two more years of brinkmanship over his hold on the office, the fiscal security, the U.S., and the basic functions of governing. Speaker of the 118th Congress, Kevin McCarthy. This morning, Speaker Kevin McCarthy settling into a role he's chased for more than a decade. That was easy, huh? <laughs> Surviving a once in a century fight with his own party to win the Speaker's gavel. It's not how you start, it's how you finish. Five days, 15 ballots, the longest and most brutal Speaker's contest since before the Civil War. Now second in line to the presidency, but at what cost? To win over conservatives, McCarthy made major concessions, including one that would allow any member to force a vote to remove him. How confident are you that you will have this job for a full two-year term? A thousand percent. His predecessor, former House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, insisting the closed-door negotiations have led to incredibly shrinking speakership, calling out the potential gridlock. This is a shame for the country. This is a great institution after being dealt one defeat after another not been has not been a speaker has not been elected mccarthy was confident that on the 14th ballot he would win 
but he came up one vote short. Matt Gates delivered the final blow. Gates. Cameras catching the dramatic standoff. McCarthy confronting Gates. Fingers pointed, words exchanged. And then moments later, Mike Rogers, the top Republican on the Armed Services Committee, physically restrained from going after Gates. Democrats shouting to stay civil. I rise to say, wow. <laughs> With the drama unfolding, Donald Trump stepping in to call the Republican holdouts. Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene spotted trying to pass her phone with the former president on the line. Then suddenly at midnight, a breakthrough. <laughs> McCarthy winning over the final six holdouts in the 15th round. We will use the power of the purse and the power of the subpoena to get the job done. In his victory speech, he pledged to put a check on the Biden administration. Our system is built on checks and balances. It's time for us to be a check and provide some balance to the president's policies. But the path ahead could be another high wire act where he will face aggressive hard right members spoiling for a fight over government spending, along with a Democrat led Senate and White House. The concessions to the right that led to his victory could limit his control and leave him the weakest speaker in modern history. In neighboring India now, parts of northern India are experiencing a severe prolonged cold wave that was thrown normal life out of gear. Dense fog has delayed more than a hundred flights and a dozen of trains, causing chaos at airports and railway stations. For more on this, we are joined by Abhi Darana World News Special Correspondent Gayatri Gunasekar from Delhi in India. Gayatri. Yes, Shanali. Authorities in capital city Delhi have asked schools to extend winter holidays and cancel classes. The minimum temperature in parts of the city has dropped to 1.9 Celsius on Sunday. The other northern states have also been grappling with an acute cold wave with temperatures fumbling to minus 6 Celsius in Indian administered Kashmir. The meteorological department has asked people to avoid or limit outdoor activities until weather conditions improve. It has also warned people to be careful while driving through dense fog. The severe cold is also expected to cause health issues, especially in Delhi, which has also experienced severe pollution levels during winter months. The extreme cold has been particularly hard for India's homeless population, who often sleeps beside roads at railway stations. On Sunday, Delhi witnessed one of the foggiest days of season so far, with a thick mist uh, covering the city for several hours. The Indian Railways, which carries some 23 million passengers daily, said that 29 uh, trains were running late in northern India. The foggy conditions have continued today as well with vehicles driving slowly on the roads. Officials have said that they expect the cold wave to begin subsiding from tomorrow. Back to you, Shanali. All right, thank you. That was Gatri Gunasekara reporting from Delhi in India. There were many emotional reunions after China lifted quarantine requirements for inbound travelers, ending almost three years of self-imposed isolation even as the country battles a surge in COVID cases. For the first time since March 2020, China has lifted pandemic restrictions on foreign travel and reopened its borders to international visitors. The easing of restrictions marks the final unravelling of the country's controversial zero-Covid policy. For the past few years, it's shielded China's 1.4 billion people from the virus, but also cut them off from the rest of the world. Now, incoming travellers will no longer need to quarantine, only provide a negative PCR test taken within the previous 48 hours. At Beijing Capital International Airport, long-awaited reunions at the arrivals hall that would have been impossible just a day ago are finally a reality. Our daughter is coming in today because there's no quarantine. So we're just thrilled that China has done away with the quarantine policy. And um, that's why she chose this flight for today, because it's the first day when people can just come right off the airplane and go home. Investors hope the reopening will reinvigorate a $17 trillion economy, suffering its slowest growth in nearly half a century. The border opening comes ahead of the start of the Lunar New Year, which was, pre-pandemic, the biggest annual migration in the world. Some two billion trips are expected this season, nearly double last year's movement. 
but the abrupt policy reversal has triggered a massive wave of infections that is overwhelming some hospitals and causing business disruptions. Several governments worried about China's current COVID spike have imposed restrictions on outbound travelers. The easing of restrictions comes after historic protests against China's COVID policy that saw frequent testing, curbs on movement and mass lockdowns that heavily damaged the world's second biggest economy. Still in the Pacific region, a delegation of parliamentarians from Germany's Free Democratic Party arrived in Taiwan in a show of support for the island's democracy amid military threats from its neighbour, China. A high-ranking parliamentary delegation from Germany arrived in Taiwan on Monday, ahead of an anticipated ministerial visit later this year in moves that could spark tensions with China. The visit was a sign of solidarity with the self-ruled democracy, which China claims as part of its territory, said Marie-Agnes Strack-Zimmermann, the chair of the Parliamentary Defence Committee and a leader of the delegation. During their four-day visit, meetings with President Tsai Ing-wen and Premier Su sang chan are also on the agenda coming as a precursor to a visit by German Education Minister Bettingstark Watzinger, also of the FDP, set for later this spring. It would be the first by a member of the German cabinet in 26 years. The two senior FDP deputies also warned against Germany becoming too economically dependent on China, its biggest trading partner in 2021. Berlin's diplomatic overtures to Taiwan are likely to rile Beijing. They also said that the current delegation would discuss the current threat situation in their meetings. China has ramped up military and political pressure against democratically governed Taiwan over the past two years as it seeks to assert its sovereignty claims which the government in Taipei strongly rejects. President Xi, China's most assertive leader in a generation, has made clear that what he calls the reunification of Taiwan cannot be passed on to future generations. Last year saw a spike in tensions as Beijing ramped up military pressure and launched its largest war games in decades to protest against a visit by the then US House Speaker Nancy Pelosi in August. China opposes any official exchanges with Taiwan and has reacted with growing anger to a flurry of visits by Western politicians to the island. Also in August, the German Air Force boosted its presence in the Indo-Pacific with a deployment of 13 military aircraft, one year after it sent a frigate to the region for the first time in almost two decades. We're going now into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more World News. Stay with us. Welcome back to World News Tonight. Now, the blame game continues in the unending war in Ukraine as Russia has claimed its military carried out a deadly retaliatory strike on barracks used by Ukrainian soldiers in the Donbass region as Ukraine denied that there were any casualties in the attack. Just days after Ukraine killed hundreds of Russian fighters in an attack on a temporary barracks in the town of Makivka on New Year's Eve, Moscow claims to have carried out a retaliation operation, a massive rocket strike in Kramatorsk. Over 600 Ukrainian servicemen were eliminated as a result of a massive missile strike on these temporary deployment points of Ukrainian armed forces units. But the mayor of Kramatorsk said there had been no deaths from strikes over the weekend and labeled Moscow's claim propaganda. According to the mayor, two educational institutions, eight apartment buildings and garages were damaged. However, no victims were reported. The huge death toll from Makivka caused anger and outrage in Russia, putting pressure on the Kremlin to be seen to retaliate. Meanwhile, Russia's defense ministry said Ukraine had returned 50 Russian servicemen after a prisoner swap on Sunday. The mutual exchange was the result of intense negotiations. The Ministry of Defense of Ukraine confirmed the exchange with the head of the Ukrainian presidential administration sharing footage of Ukrainian soldiers singing the national anthem on their bus ride home. U.S. President Joe Biden makes his first visit to the U.S.-Mexico border since taking office. The trip comes as the humanitarian crisis there is growing. Facing growing pressure, President Biden in El Paso tonight, coming face to face with the crisis at the border for the first time since taking office two years ago. While the president didn't meet directly with migrants, he assessed enforcement for himself in El Paso, where crossings reached record highs in mid-December, but have since slowed. 
Republicans, including Texas Governor Greg Abbott, who handed the president a letter calling for him to secure the border, blasting Mr. Biden. He should have been down here from day one to fix the problem that he created. But the president is touting his new plan, which he says aims to expel from the U.S. to Mexico 30,000 migrants a month who unlawfully entered the country from origins including Venezuela, Nicaragua, Haiti and Cuba. Meanwhile, images of the humanitarian crisis everywhere, including outside this El Paso church, where at least six migrants were arrested today. Some residents are accusing authorities of trying to sanitize the crisis for the president, an allegation U.S. Customs and Border Protection forcefully denies, saying the arrests are in response to migrants evading apprehension. Still, for many migrants like Maria Rodriguez, their only focus, they say, is finding a better life. Rodriguez says her two children and nephew escaped the violence in Venezuela, a journey that took four months. At some point, she says, even walking over dead bodies, a thought that brings her to tears. Rodriguez says once in Mexico, they traveled across the border by hiding in a garbage truck for five days. Over in Iran, the UN Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights and the European Union have urged Iran to halt all executions following the hanging of two men engaged in the Armenian protests. Iran hanged two men on Saturday for allegedly killing a member of the security forces during national protests that stemmed from the death of 22-year-old Masa Amini in September. Video that aired on Iranian state television Saturday showed two defendants identified as Mohammed Mehdi Karami and Syed Mohammed Osseini testifying in court on an unspecified date in December 2022. Both were convicted of killing Ruhala Ajamian, a member of the besieged paramilitary force militia. Three others have been sentenced to death in the same case while 11 received prison sentences. Amnesty International said that the court that convicted Karami relied on forced confessions. And Hosseini's lawyer said in a tweet in December that Hosseini had been severely tortured. Iran denies that confessions are extracted under torture. The executions of Karami and Hosseini brings to four the number of protesters officially known to have been executed in the aftermath of the unrest. Amnesty has said Iranian authorities are seeking the death penalty for at least 26 others. The news of the executions brought condemnation from the European Union, the U.S., and others, with British Foreign Minister James Cleverly calling on Iran to, quote, immediately end the violence against its own people. Scores of climate activists have taken over a village in western Germany hoping to stop an open-air mining company from digging up brown coal on the site. A judge has given police permission to expel the activists on January 10th, but the young people said that they are fighting for the future of the planet and have no intention of moving. They want to block all access to Lutzerath to prevent it from being wiped off the map. Hundreds of activists are occupying this little village in North Rhineland, Westphalia. The goal? To stop the extraction of some 280 million tons of brown coal. We must absolutely stop them from burning the coal underfoot. Lutzerath is our last stand. Just a few dozen meters away stretches the giant open-air mine of Gatsfeile. It has swallowed up some 20 villages already. Lützerath will be the last, and so has become a symbol. David Drazen grew up in the neighboring village. He says he's fighting to save the region, but for both himself and his friend Maha, it's also a struggle to defend climate objectives. But the police are mobilizing too. They have to evacuate the activists, and it won't be easy. We are going to have to deal with people who will chain themselves to strategic points, who will build obstacles for us, and there are tree houses behind the village, so we are going to have to be very prudent and professional. In the activists' village, they're practicing rope climbing. They've built dozens of tree houses, high up and hard to reach. But they're also getting ready to set up barricades. This young Swiss man says they must try everything to stop the expulsion. In terms of numbers, we're not coming out on top, but we have ideas and we do everything we can. In any case, we can't give up. The order to evacuate comes into effect on January the 10th. The Lutzrath activists hope for reinforcements numbering in the thousands.
welcome back to World News tonight and for more news let's take you around the world in a minute. Sweden's Prime Minister said Sweden is confident that Turkey will approve its application to join the NATO military alliance but cannot fulfill all the conditions Ankara has set for its support. Australian Prime Minister Anthony Albanese promised to help to repair homes, replace property and rebuild infrastructure as he toured remote flood-ravaged communities across the northwest after one in hundred year floods. Indonesian President Joko Widodo met with Malaysian Prime Minister Anwar Ibrahim and discussed the development of Indonesia's planned new capital during bilateral talks. Hundreds of people demonstrated in the courtyard of the Prague Castle celebrating Czech President Milo Zeman leaving office and calling for a pro-Western candidate to win the presidential election later this month. Lagos Hope, the largest floating international book fair docked at Egypt's canal city of Port. The ship's captain, James Berry, said that visitors are offered a selection of around 5,000 different titles. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. And in case you missed to watch any of the stories we aired tonight, you can always rewatch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. Now we are leaving you tonight with Colombians taking to the streets in the annual Blacks and Whites Carnival, celebrating diversity in the southwestern city of Pasto. Stay safe and have a good night.